Good morning once again. We'd like to welcome those that are now joining us in our live stream. Today we are continuing our study in Psalm 51. And so we'll be reading that beginning with verse 1. And as we read, I would invite us to remember this is God's word. And just as it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, let's invite God's spirit to speak to our hearts. To make this come alive to us. And so as David prays, we read, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure make Zion prosper, Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. <clears throat> Let us pray as we seek God's guidance. <clears throat> Excuse me. O oh Lord, we give ourselves up before you today. We invite you to speak to our hearts. Lord, I confess that I am totally inadequate to teach this word. I ask, O oh Lord, for your anointing power. Lord, I confess that we can do nothing without you. If this word is to come alive, it will be through your power and your Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask for your cleansing that you would make me a vessel that is fit for your use. And Lord, the desire that we have here today is to glorify you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, 
last week as we began looking in Psalm 51, we found that it is a paradigm on how to deal with a guilty conscience. Something that nearly every one of us experiences. And yet something that we all deal with differently. And sometimes we don't deal with it correctly. You may remember King David wrote this psalm after Nathan the prophet confronted him about his sin. David has committed adultery. He's had the husband of the woman murdered in battle. He has taken her to be his own wife, and he's trying to cover it all up. And when Nathan confronted David, he was cut to the heart, and he confesses, I have sinned. And so Psalm 51 is David's prayer of confession and repentance. How to deal with a guilty conscience. And the very first thing that David does in his prayers, we find that it is a prayer for pardon. And he specifically asks God for three things. The first thing that he asks for is mercy. Have mercy on me, O God. He doesn't seek justice. He doesn't want justice. The last thing that he wants is justice. David wants mercy. You see, justice is when we get what we deserve. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve. But not only does he ask for mercy, he also asks for pardon. Blot out my transgressions. See, he is literally asking God to just wipe them out, to obliterate his sin. And we find that when we come to God in a sincere prayer of confession and repentance, God responds by saying that he will remove our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. He says that he will hurl them into the depths of the sea. And so after asking for mercy and pardon, David asks for cleansing. When he prays, wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, he's asking God to make him as clean and as pure as if he had never sinned. And so once again, we learn that when we sincerely come before God in confession and repentance, God says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Now we may be wondering how David can make such a bold request. How can he literally be asking God for mercy and pardon and cleansing with all that he has done? And David knows that he is asking upon the basis of God's character. He's not asking because he's worthy. He's not asking because he deserves it. But he's asking according to the basis of God's unfailing love. Now we looked at this last week and the word that is used here is hesed. That is the unconditional, unfailing love of God. It is the very foundation of who God is and his character. Everything that God does is based upon his unfailing love, his unconditional love. And David knows he's also asking according to God's great compassion. See, it's God's great compassion that moves him to relieve our suffering that we inflicted upon ourselves by our own sin and guilt. We hurt ourselves and God in his great compassion is removed to relieve our suffering. But one of the things we know about compassion is compassion costs us. 
the greater the compassion, the greater the cost. And because of God's great compassion, he is moved to pay our sin debt. And it cost him dearly. That's what the cross of Christ is all about. The cross is about God's compassion to relieve our suffering that has been produced by our sin and guilt. And so to relieve our suffering requires that God suffer greatly. After David's prayer for pardon, for forgiveness, he prays for purifying power. Now you may be thinking, okay, now wait a minute. David has already asked for cleansing. Why does he need to be praying for purifying power? He's already been forgiven. What else does he need? And I think the answer to that is found in David's character. Because the Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. You see, what David wants, even more than the forgiveness, is that personal, intimate relationship with God. And when you're wanting that deep relationship with God, you begin to understand that forgiveness is just the beginning. It's not the end of a process. This is where we begin. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sinned Confess that sin, and then you. Is it called a rhetorical question? I already know the answer. Of course you have. We all have, if we're honest. And if we're not honest, then we're still repeating that pattern of lying. But we've all done that. And so what we need is a purifying power in our life. It reminded me of a commercial I've seen. You know, you, perhaps you've seen this. I don't even remember what it was, but it says, wash, rinse, repeat. So often that's what our prayers for forgiveness are like, aren't they? We sin, we come and we ask for washing, we ask for that rinsing, and then we go out and do the same thing again. Wash, rinse, repeat. Wash, rinse, repeat. And so what we really need is a purifying power that is going to keep us from that repeated pattern of sin. You see, forgiveness makes us right with God. Purifying power keeps us right with God. See, we have a struggle. We looked at this when we were in Romans chapter 7 when Paul described it when he said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Wash, rinse, repeat. Keep on doing it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. And if you've ever experienced that, it's exactly what you feel like. What a wretch I am. And so he asked the question, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then we have the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, what Paul's talking about, what David is talking about here, is that sin is not just a superficial problem. It has roots that go deep into the very core of our being. In fact, that's what David's talking about in verse 5 when he says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We're sinners by nature. 
And I know that's hard sometimes for us to understand. I mean, you see a newborn baby come into this world, and I mean, they're just so wonderful, and it's a miraculous gift of life. But if we're going to be really honest, it doesn't take but just a moment for that baby's sinful nature to show up. Because there is nothing more self-centered than a newborn baby. Baby says, if I want something, I want it, and I want it now. If I'm hungry, I'm hungry now, and I want you to feed me now, and I am going to scream until you do. I need changed, I need change now, and I am going to scream until you do. I don't feel good, and I'm going to scream until you figure it out. And then we spend our lives as parents trying to teach them not to live that way. And then it just continues on. Because we enter into adulthood. Hopefully we learned a little bit, but we still have that self-centeredness that comes into our life. See, I was sinful at birth, he says. The roots of my sinful nature go deep. And so we need help in our inner life. And so David's prayer for purifying power reveals to us a path to keep us from falling back into a repeated pattern of sin and guilt. It's the power to keep us from doing the things we don't want to do. The power to do the things we do want to do. And so on this path to purifying, to purifying power and to victory, he says the very first step is truth and wisdom. Verse 6, surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. And so how do we know truth? That's been a question people have been asking for centuries. You may remember when Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate asked the question, what is truth? We live in a world today where people are still asking the same question, only we've even become more absurd where we think everybody has their own truth. Now, really, that statement in itself is totally absurd. It is impossible for everybody to have their own truth and then it still be truth. Now, it is true we all have our own opinions, but opinions are not truth. Opinions are opinions. Sometimes they may be true. Sometimes they're as far from it as you can possibly get. So how do we know the truth? Well, Jesus answers that for us in John chapter 17 when he says, sanctify them, that is, make them pure. That's what we're talking about. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. See, the only way that we can know truth is by getting into the word of God. That is where we find the absolute standard of truth. It's where we find the absolute standard of reality. Outside of that, then it does become questionable what truth is. But God says, I have given you my truth. That's why it's so important for us to be into the word of God. I have shared that on so many occasions. Listen, you cannot know truth apart from the word of God. You will not have it. It's the only way to have it. Now, what does David mean when he says, you desire truth in the inner parts? Well, the inner parts is our moral compass. It's where we have the ability to determine what is right and wrong. And so the only way to direct our moral compass, the only way to have it point true north, is through the truth of God's word. Now, truth alone is not enough. I know it sounds like it is. 
but in our personal lives, we also need wisdom so we can correctly apply the truth. See, it's one thing to know something, it's something else to apply it. And it requires wisdom to do that. And so we have to have that. That's why David says, you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. We get wisdom from the same place we get truth. Truth comes from God. Wisdom comes from God. You teach me truth. That's what James says in James chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, now I won't ask you to raise your hands, but we all should. We're all lacking in wisdom. And if you think you're not lacking in wisdom, you're probably lacking more than anybody else could be lacking. To think that you're not lacking in wisdom is an indication that you really don't have any wisdom. And so he says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. I'll tell you right now, we have covered my two most common prayers. Most common prayer that I think I ever pray is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out all my iniquities. Cleanse me of all of my transgressions. Make me clean and pure in your sight. And then after that one, I'm praying for wisdom. And he doesn't say just pray one time. I, I think sometimes we get this idea that we just ask once and that's that. But when you need wisdom, you ask for wisdom. It keeps you coming back to the same source. The same source is always there. The same source is always willing to provide. I cannot tell you how many times I'm faced with a decision and I am instantly praying, God, give me wisdom. I don't know what to do here. See, wisdom is where we take the truth of God and we correctly apply it into our lives. Now, what's also interesting here is the word that David uses for inmost place means to fill in the gaps. Give me wisdom to fill in the gaps. This is great. This is how it works in our lives. So the Bible doesn't address every issue that you're going to face in life. The Bible gives you the truth. Wisdom helps you take that truth and fill in the gaps. See, sometimes we get this idea that some things are just gray, that there's really not a right or a wrong way to do this, and some things that may be true, but there are a lot of other areas in our life we see it as gray because the Bible doesn't specifically say what to do here. Well, when we have the truth with wisdom, it fills in the gaps. Sometimes it's not gray at all. It's purely black and white. And wisdom takes the truth and fills in those gaps. You see, truth and wisdom work in tandem. We need both. We don't need one at the expense of the other. We need to know the truth. We need to know the truth about ourselves. We need to know the truth about our sin. We need to know the truth about our sinful nature. And we need to exercise the wisdom of God to keep us from falling back into a repeated pattern of sin. And so the first step in remaining pure is to be set free from guilt and shame through truth and wisdom. Otherwise, we just fall right back into that repeated pattern. The next step that we find is purifying power also involves a cleansing from sin. Now you may be thinking, well, now wait a minute, we've already covered that. David has already asked for cleansing, and that's true. But what he does now is he goes to the very core of how we are cleansed. And so it's understanding that cleansing and why we are actually clean and pure because of God. In verse 7, he says, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Now, I imagine there's a lot of us, when we read that, we are thinking, what is hyssop? Why hyssop? 
I'm so glad you asked. See, hyssop was a, or is, a bushy plant that grows in Israel, it grows in the desert, and it grew in Egypt. And it was what they would use to take the blood from a sacrifice and apply it to the altar. You see, what David is talking about is the need for a blood sacrifice. As the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, this also tells us that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. See, every one of those sacrifices in the Old Testament was pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that John said is the one who takes away the sins of the world. And so David is saying, we need this blood sacrifice. And when the blood, the blood of Christ is applied to our hearts, it makes us whiter than snow, spotless. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. This morning we sang nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. It's a powerful song. It proclaims exactly what he's talking about here. We need the blood of Jesus. That's where the power comes for cleansing us from our sin. And when we begin to understand that, this purifying power results in rejoicing. David says in verse 8, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Now, literally, what David is saying is make me to hear. Not let me hear, but make me to hear joy and gladness. Do you see what's going on in this passage? When we feel the weight of our sin and guilt, it crushes us. That's what David's talking about, the bones that you have crushed. Because that's exactly what sin and guilt does to us. It's a huge burden that's upon us. One that we don't feel that we can ever get relieved from. And when that burden is removed through the blood of Jesus Christ, it results in rejoicing and gladness. See, the very moment that we understand that the blood of Jesus covers our sin and that we are covered in the righteousness of Christ, it brings joy. Now notice he did not say happiness. We get all tore up about happiness. We think that we're supposed to be happy. Ask almost any mother, what do you want for your children? And they'll say, I just want them to be happy. It isn't going to happen. You cannot perpetually be Happy. Happiness is contingent upon what is happening. And you can go to the happiest place on earth and see the kids aren't happy. It just doesn't happen. See, happiness is temporary. Happiness is transitory. It's superficial. And what he's saying that we need is this deep abiding joy within our spirit. It doesn't depend on what's happening. It's deep and it's abiding and it's always there. And the gladness is when it is manifested outwardly in our life. But it all comes from the inner, inner joy. Now purifying power also involves a recognition of what God does with our sin. In verse 9 he says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. And since God has wiped out our sins, they have been removed from his face and that means he'll never throw them back into your face. Now that means when your sin is thrown back into your face, God didn't do it. Satan will do it. He loves to do that. 
He loves to remind you of your past failures. It is his favorite pastime. And there's a reason why he wants to do that. Because if he can keep you focusing on your past failures, he keeps you from focusing on your future success. I'll just keep you bound to the past. That's what Satan wants to do. And so he's always throwing your past up to your face. Sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes we just do that. I mean, we just keep churning it up, regurgitating that same mess all over again. And others will do it. But God never throws our sin back into our face. Anytime you hear that coming into your head, remember when that's not from God. He has removed them from his face. In fact, what God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. I remember your sins no more. They have been removed from his face. He's not looking at our sin. It is gone. That's what it means to be blotted out. They are gone. That's what God does with it. He sets us free from our past. Now, purifying power also requires a renewing of our heart. David says in verse 10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. See, since we are naturally inclined to do evil, we need a heart that is naturally inclined to good. We need a heart transplant. We need a new heart. And only God can do that. Created to create it. That's not creating. When God creates, he creates from nothing, just as when he created this earth. And God can create a new heart in us. In fact, that's what he does. That's what the gospel is telling us, that when we come to know Jesus Christ, we are made new creations. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And so you can have that new heart through Jesus Christ. And then that purifying power requires a steadfast spirit along with a new heart. And so what we are needing is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And so when we come to know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and he moves into our spirit. It becomes new as well. And so through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, we can have But God is saying, I'm giving you everything you need, a renewed heart and a steadfast spirit. But there's also something else that we need. And that's reassurance. It's essential. Here's what David says, verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. See, our sin tells us that God ought to reject us, especially when we've been in a repeated pattern of sin. Satan will tell you God ought to reject you. And so we need the assurance that God has not rejected me that I do belong to him. And so David says, this is what I am needing here. I need to know that you have not rejected me. Do not cast me from your presence. And so we read in 1 John, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. so many believers over the years that if you were to ask them do they know beyond a shadow of a doubt they're going to go to heaven when they die 
And they'll say, I sure hope so. I think they use that word the same way they did when they bought the lottery ticket. I sure hope. He doesn't want you hoping so. John says, I write this so that you can know that you have eternal life. See, God wants us to know that we have not been rejected. Now, who doesn't want you to know that? Well, obviously, it's the devil. And it simply makes sense. You see, if the devil can make you wonder if you're going to have the assurance of your own salvation, how can you go out and tell anybody give you a guaranteed inheritance in the kingdom of God if you're not sure you're to th actually believe that somehow God will reject us. And he's not going to, so we need reassurance. And purifying power results in a restored fellowship. David says in verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, he did not say, restore to me your salvation. In other words, I sinned, I lost it, now I need it restored. No, that's not what he does. But what sin does is it robs us of the... I'm not going to have the joy of my salvation. And so David says, restore to me the joy. And when we have that purifying power, the joy comes flooding back into our lives. And then purifying power results in a redirection of life. David says, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be turned back to you. See, when we have that Holy Spirit sustaining our spirit, and we're experiencing that purifying power in our lives, it reminds us of the purpose of our life. Why am I here? Now, people have been asking that question for centuries. Why am I here? You find the answer to that in the gospel message. You're here for God. First of all, you are here to love God. Top of the list, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. You're to love others. And part of that loving others is reaching out because David says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be turned back to you. The joy of being in a relationship with the living God. Jesus stated it this way, go and make disciples. He also said, you'll be my witnesses. Now, what does a witness do? A witness simply tells what they've seen and experienced. When you've experienced that joy of your salvation, the joy of having your sin removed from you as far as the east is from the west, the joy of a relationship with the living God, you want others to have what you've experienced. And so we go and we share that good news. In our power. The Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in us when we come to know Jesus Christ. We have begun learning through the purifying power that it's not our power. It's the power of God that works within us. And so his spirit comes in and he releases the very power and the nature of Christ to us. And what we have to learn to do is to appropriate that. And wisdom. And then we will begin 
learning how to appropriate the power. Purifying power and the power to accomplish what it is that God has called us to do in our life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We ask that you'll just take it and use it in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, that you will draw us closer to you. And it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.